All right. Welcome everybody back to another lovely Unity workshop of ours. Um, today we're covering, it says menus and timers, but it's just gonna be um, a bunch of miscellaneous things. So it looks scary as we have six sections, but they're all gonna be pretty short today um, because we have this session and then next week's session, and after next week's section, we have the game jam. And sign I'm, up. what? Sign up. Yeah, sign up for the game jam. We'll have a QR code at the end of, uh, at the end of today's uh, slideshow for that. But essentially, my goal is to get you guys up to speed and kind of comfortable with the basics of Unity to f be comfortable participating in the game jam. And so today and next week, we're covering just kind of a bunch of small little ends here and there that I think are pretty valuable. Um, so that's why these are all kind of all over the place. But we'll start off with camera movement. So, um, so far we've, we've programmed a bunch of stuff onto the platform that we've been developing. Um, those assets you can find online um, on the emails and announcements that I send out. There's like an assets link, the GitHub link that you can follow to find all those assets of the platform that we've been working on so far. But essentially we have uh, our player moving and we have kind of the level layout, but our camera does not follow the player so far. So I want for my camera movement, I want it to be very, very simple, right? So I just want it to follow the player directly and I want it to have limits, right? So I don't want it to showcase things that are out of bounds. Um, so I'm just wondering if you guys have any idea of how to do this, right? So if you're programming this um, and you want very simple camera movement, do you have any ideas on how you would program something like this? Yeah. I've done a few things like if you have like a collision box for the camera and attach a character to it. Oh, okay. Oh, so you can move the, uh, the camera around like manually? Uh, no, the camera would be attached to the character, but uh, there's like a collision box for it specifically. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's kind of like it's attached to the player directly in a way. Yeah, but you know, it won't go too far. Mm -hmm. Even if the player goes all the way to the end, it won't move past that. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? There's multiple ways to do this. I'm just curious. Okay, so the way that I kind of did it um, was essentially every object in Unity has a transform component attached to it, and transform just means like your position and your scale and stuff like that. And so essentially I was thinking, okay, well, the player has a position and the camera also has a position. So what I can do every single frame is just to fetch the position of the player and set the position of the camera to that position of the player. And then I can also declare some sort of um, like field variables for my minimum and maximum and just be like, okay, if the current value that I'm getting is less than my minimum, then set it to the minimum and so on, right? So as kind of like a run through of this, it's a whole lot, but essentially is we have the camera's transform. We set that position of that transform to be the player's transform. Um, and right here, this is kind of the view from the inspector once we get the script working. But essentially, see here we have this uh, property for target, and we drag and drop really easily into here the transform of the player directly from the player kind of, you know, component in a way. And so we can just drag that in, and that way we can save it through our editor to have a reference to the player's transform position. Here we have this min x, min max x, min y, max y as these fields that show up in the editor like this so I could tweak them and fiddle with them. Um, and essentially that's going to be my bounds for my camera, that they don't go past that, right? And remember we can show variables inside of the editor using the serialized field um, keyword, which I will go over because after this I'm going to jump into Unity and, and code this with you guys. Um, and we want to also showcase this uh, variable in the editor for the Z position. Now, we're working in 2D, so you're like, why do we have a Z position if in two dimensions we have just X and Y? Um, and I will show you, but 2D in Unity is just like a very limited 3D game, actually. It's really cool, I'll, I'll show you. So the Z position still exists, um, but for 2D games, they're just kind of used for, for different layers of objects. And obviously we want our camera to be behind everything so that it can see everything, right? Because if it's in front of everything, then it can't see those things. 
So I just set it to a negative value because by default, everything else has a Z value of zero for 2D games. And that way, in the script, all we'll do is just, we'll just set the Z position to this variable every single frame. And then that's a link, but it's a math function for clamping. So whenever we have an X and Y position, we're just gonna clamp the, the current value to those min and max values. And so we'll see that our script is like maybe 20 lines of code, 10 lines of code actually. Uh, really, really nice and, and short. And then it's very, it's, again, it's a very simple script. So I wanna jump into Unity to showcase what I mean by that. So what I, what I wanted to show you is that a 2D game is just a hidden 3D game because up here in our editor, we have this button that, that says 2D and you can click on it and then boom, now you're in 3D. And so that's, you know, it's a hidden 3D game all <coughs> along. But you can just click this button back to get to our 2D view, which is a lot nicer for what we have. But I want to create our script. So I'm going to go into my scripts folder to keep, you know, good practice of organizing everything. And then there's like this plus sign, or you can right click to create a C-sharp script. I'm just going to call it camera because that's going to be my main camera script. And I'll open it up. And let's see. Oh, maybe, maybe not the camera. So it says here, script camera has the same name as a built-in Unity component. So I'm just going to rename it to camera follow. And up here, if you rename something, you want to name it, rename it up here as well. So I'll just name it camera follow because it was yelling at me that it's named the same as something else. Uh, but based on our slides here, we have this, all of these are serialized fields, right? And so I'm just going to put that in my script. So at the top here, I'll have, okay, we want a um, serialized field, right? And then we have the tar of transform of our player. So I'm going to call it target, right? But the type of it is going to be transform. So it's a variable named target that has a type of transform. And we can see when we go, uh, I'm gonna go into my editor again, and I'm gonna drag the script from my project. I'm just gonna click and drag it onto the main camera. And then we see here that in our script, there's this target like little field, this little box that pops up. And it says none right now. But what I can do is yoink this transform. So what I'm doing is I'm, I clicked on player and then I go to transform and I could just click and drag it. And then I think I can just, no. How did I do this last time? Maybe. Liz, you can just drag the game on. Oh, that's what I did. Yes, sorry. Thank you. So you can, oh, sorry. I clicked my main camera and I, it knows, yeah, so exactly. So it knows that it's going to have a transform component. So I'm actually just going to drag the entire player object onto here and it's only going to take the transform of that player. So thank you. Yes. Uh, because you need it, you know, <laughs> I need both of those to show. So I just clicked and dragged the player over here and now it shows that there's a, uh, it says player right there. Great, that's what we want. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna create similar fields for, for example, um, we have our min x value, um, we have our min y value. I'm gonna actually just copy paste this. Then we have our maximum x, and then we have our maximum y. And then based on our slides, the last thing that we have is the camera Z position. So I'm going to add a field for that as well. And so if you go to your editor after it compiles, you'll see that these are all set there by default equal to zero. But 
in my game. So I'm actually going to set this to negative 10. Um, and I'll just keep it at negative 10. But to get the minimum x and y values, you just kind of, for example, you take the player or something, or, or you know any object, and you just kind of drag it to like, OK, and probably here is like the lower left corner. So I'm going to look over in my transform and be like, oh, OK, it's at negative 11, negative 4 and a half, maybe, right? That's kind of my minimum x and my minimum y. So I'm going to go here minimum x and minimum y. And then for now, I'll have like, uh, for example, again, I'll just drag my player. So this is kind of like up here. It's like 10, looks like 11 with another 4.5 for the maximum x and y. So 10, maybe like 11, and then 4.5. So I just played around and moved some stuff around to get those numbers. And that's why I want them to be revealed in the editor like that, so I can just tweak it real quick. And now that we have those, what we actually want to do is, again, right here, we want to set the camera's position to the player's position. And we want to do that every single frame, right? So here, we have the start function that's called when the like, script is first called. But w for, this pr for the purpose of the camera, we're not doing anything when the camera is first created, right? So we're just going to get rid of this part. So in our update, we want to get the position of the target transform. Does anybody remember how to get the position part of the, the property called position from target? Target dot get component. Uh, <coughs> uh, dot. Hang on, let me look at it again. Sure. Uh, dot uh, position <coughs> dot x or dot y. Yep. So we don't quite need the get component right now. So get component is if we want to, oh, for example, right, 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 right. get the transform component. But since we already have access to the component of transform, we could just do tar target dot position. So if you click dot, see how a bunch of stuff comes up? So you could see what you have access to here. And I do have position down here, right? And we can access it individually with x, y, and z if we do dot x, dot y, dot z. But what I'm looking to do is I'm saving the current position of um, my target's position, right? And then I'm going to basically check that my x and y components are within my bounds. I'm going to set the z position to my camera z position. And then I'm going to set the position of the camera to the target position. So this is target position, right? And we, that's how we fetch it. But I'm going to save it into something called maybe like target pause, for example. So that's like the variable that I'm saving it in. There we go. Yeah. Um, but then if we, we need a type for this, right? So if we hover over position, actually, it's kind of small, but you can see that it says vector 3. So position is a vector 3 because it has three values, right? x, y, and z components. So here, vector 3. So I'm creating a variable called target pause, target position. Uh, it's a type of vector 3. And I'm basically saving a copy of the target's position into that variable. Now I want to check that my x and y components fall into my, my bounds, right? And what we can do. Um, as um, as we mentioned before, we can access each individual one like so. Target position dot x, target position dot y, and we can use a math function called clamp to just check if it's within our bounds and if it's outside of our bounds, it sets it to those bounds. So it's really useful. I found out about this function through watching tutorials, and now I use it myself. It's very useful. So to do that, there's a library called mathf. It's included in Unity. And there's a function called clamp. So if you hover over clamp, I guess. There we go. Um, again, it's small here, but the documentation shows you that math clamp takes three um, var values by default. You have the current value, then you have the minimum, then you have the maximum. 
And so if it's outside the min or max, it's going to set it to either the min or the max. So here I'm going to put my x value, right? That's the value that I'm checking. And then what I'm checking it against. So in this case, it's going to be the, my min x mal value, my max x value. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? Does that function? And I'll do the same exact thing for my y, my y values. So I personally just copy pasted it, but you want to make sure you want to be very careful with when you copy paste stuff, uh, so that you don't miss anything small and then it breaks your game. <laughs> so that's my x and y value. And then does anybody remember what I t what I said about the z value? What I'm going to set the target position of the camera to be for the z value. I have this field up here called camera Z that I set, right? And actually, I could also put it in script here that is negative 10. And I'm just going to set that to like, that, like so, right? Because that, that doesn't depend on the player position. That's just always going to be negative 10 because I want it to be always you know, behind everything in a way to see everything. So now that I, in a, in a way, I got the target position, I copied it over to my own variable. I double checked that my x and y position are indeed within my bounds, and I set the z value. And now I just want to set the camera's transform equal to this position, right? So, to get the to reference the value or the object that the script is attached to. So remember, we attach the script to the camera, the main camera object, and we reference that with a lowercase game object, right? So game object with lowercase g means this object that the script is attached to. Then we get the transform. So this is very handy. It's included in Unity. You don't need to get, do get components since you're going to use it so often. It's Unity inclusive for you. And then again, we have our position. And so we set that to our target position that we've been calculating. Right? So again, we get it. We set it or we calculate each individual component and then we set it back to our camera and we update our camera's position based on that. So to show what we've had so far, I'm going to quickly run the game. And now if I jump, the camera moves with us, which is pretty cool. Although obviously my minimum and maximum didn't work quite well. I think it's because of the size of the camera. Oh, I, I remember why. I'll have to change it. Also, if you see very carefully, once our player dies at the bottom here, all the way down here in the red, it says um, missing reference exception. The object of type transform has been destroyed. So it's giving you a warning. It's like, OK, well, this doesn't work. Go fix it. So essentially, um, two things is that the min and max is um, what I calculated by just dragging the player, sorry, here, to the edges down here, right? But the position of the camera is, uh, the position of the camera is where it's centered at. And so what I'm saying, I'm technically what I'm saying here is that the center of the camera can't go past these values. And so again, to calculate it, I guess you could also kind of drag it like this, for example. So I would actually probably do that, where it's like negative 0 0.5. That's probably a better way to do it. And then min y 0 0.7, maybe. Yeah. And then, for example, like, like so. <coughs> Max is one, and then zero point five. So now, if I update that real quick, because I again I, I forgot that it's the center of the camera. Now it properly clamps it. So now, when I move my player over in this corner, the camera does not move. But if I put it over here, right, when I jump over this enemy, I'm not near my bounds. My level is really small, so it only moves a little bit, but. You see that it, you know, it follows my player now, which is pretty cool. And then the other thing with the error, what happens is 
once the player dies, this target is undefined. And so we can check really easily here in our update that if my target's not defined, I'm not gonna do anything. And the way to check if something is defined or not is with this operator, the, the exclamation point, which is, is like the not, it's like the opposite. So for example, not false is, not true is false, not false is true. Right, so that's kind of, those, those are equivalent. So, right, so that, that's, we could do that. But we can also check for existence using this. So if we were to say something like if target, it doesn't quite, you know, it doesn't quite read well, but we're saying if the target exists, then we do something. But I wanna check if it doesn't exist. So I say if the target does not exist, so with an exclamation point, I don't wanna do anything. And so we return. And what return does, the keyword return, it just, it just stops the function. So essentially, if my target is, doesn't exist, we stop the function. What's up? Is there any advantage to, doing, to checking if the target does not exist and just returning versus saying if the target does exist, do this? Does it matter? Or? I don't think so. I think that's just personal programming preference. I don't think there's any performance of, uh, regarding that. I guess for me personally, I like it this way because then I don't have extra brackets to deal with. Because as we see here, this if statement's on one line, which is pretty simple to, to code. Um, and that's, I can run it again. We don't get an, we, go, we won't get the error when we run the game now or when we, when our player dies. Right, so you can't see it, but there is no red error. So that's, it's happy now. So that's, that's that. That's our camera movement. Is there any questions here? I can pull up the script real quick. Are there any, which is again, very short and sweet. Is there any questions about the camera movement? Okay. All right, so again, moving along. Now, going elsewhere, we're gonna talk about prefabs. Real short and sweet, um, very, very useful. So what is a prefab? So in Unity, a prefab is basically, and again, that's a link that's underlined. It's essentially a game object like we have in our hierarchy where you apply a bunch of stuff to it and then essentially creates kind of like, like a blueprint for it and you can reuse it in other parts of your game. So for example, th um, in these pictures, we have the enemy and the goal and this little, this little blue box icon means that it's a prefab. And the reason why I want my, for example, I want my enemy to be a prefab is because it has a bunch of components attached to it, has a script attached to it with different values set to those in that script. Um, and I want to reuse that enemy in other parts of my game. So I'm gonna create a prefab and then just drag and drop that prefab elsewhere. And the reason why prefabs are so powerful is that let's say I want my enemies, I want all of my enemies to be bigger or something like that, right? I can just change the prefab to be bigger, and then all of those instances of that prefab will get updated, right? And you can create one very easily by just dragging an object from the hierarchy view into the project tab, and it'll, again, have this blue little icon. The second picture in the middle here is just say, showing um, some of them inside of the hierarchy view. Um, and then down here, it's when we have the prefab view. So again, I said, if you want to update your prefab um, for whatever property, then you can click this little arrow if it's in the hierarchy, or you can double click on it in the project tab, and then it'll showcase this enemy, like the name of the prefab. Uh, I'll show you, it has like a blue background, and then you can ch make changes there. So I wanna just real quick um, make some prefabs in our project. So to do so, as good, you know, good practice, I'm going to make a new folder inside of my assets folder called prefabs. What the? Prefabs. Mm -hmm. And then I personally want my player, my enemy, and my goal to be prefabs. Um, this also, the reason why is because if I want to have multiple levels for this game, which you totally could do on your own after this workshop is done. We only will have just the one level, but it's really easy to jump into another one. 
Um, essentially, I will have obviously a player and a goal for each of those levels, which is, again, I want to reuse stuff. So that's why I'm going to make it into a prefab in case I make changes to one later. So I'm going to make a player prefab, just drag it over here. And boom, see? We have this player prefab because it's got a little blue icon. And now up in my hierarchy, it's blue. And then my goal, I'm going to drag and drop it here. And my enemy, I'm going to drag and drop it here. Right? And so now, let's say I want two enemies. Actually, let me make this goal not float. Okay. My enemy. Okay. I'm gonna have uh, two enemies, I guess. And I'm just gonna. What I what you can do with prefabs is drag it again. Lots of drag and dropping. You can drag it from your project view like this and just drop it into your scene, and it'll place it wherever you place it with your mouse. Oops. And now I have two. Two enemies, right? Pretty neat, right? That's it uh, with uh, what prefabs are. Another cool thing is prefab variants, um, which are indicated by this icon that is a prefab icon but has some like lines, but like kind of shading in a way. Essentially, you can create a variant of a prefab and you can change something. For example, all I did here was I changed the color for it, but essentially, the property that you changed will only apply to the variant that all the other properties that you didn't change will inherit from the prefab that it's based off of. So um, it's really easy to do because in the project tab, you click on, let me show you. Let's say to do that, I right click on my enemy. You can go create and then prefab variant, right? And then you'll click on that, it makes a variant. I can go in to and change the color of it and so on. To go into a prefab to change it, you just double click it down here. And as you can see, um, up here it says enemy. It says scenes and then enemy, which means I'm, a, I'm looking at a prefab. And then the background is this dark blue color, which means, OK, I'm editing my prefab now. And you can see it says only enemy here, and it has all of my components there. And I can modify it and so on. Another thing is, for example, here, let's say I have an enemy inside of my project already, inside of my scene. Let's say I change the scale of it, like so. You'll see that over here, I'll add maybe a picture to the slides later. I forgot to add a picture of this. But you'll see under where it says the name and the tag, it says prefab en enemy overrides. So let's say I changed the property of this one enemy, and I want it to apply to all of them. I can change one directly, and then I can click Overrides, and then basically apply all, and it'll apply it to the prefab, right? So again, with this one, I made some changes, and then it says here, like, it, see how it says Transform? It's because I added the Transform. I can click Apply, and then it'll apply it to all of them. Or what I could do instead, let's say I, I know that I want to do that to all the prefabs instead of just the one. I can go back to my prefab view, change my size here, go back to my scene, and now they're bigger. They're also in the ground because their center point is actually like above them so that they go into the ground, which is fun. <laughs> but again, that's, um, I'm going to revert that change. But that's just something with prefabs and playing around with prefabs, very useful stuff there. So I just want to, so far what we have covered, check in with you guys. But I want you guys to try to make this variant of a blue enemy or whatever else you want, right? So I made it blue, so you can make it flipped, for example, or standing up or whatever else. Um, and then I also want you to check how, again, the inheritance works. So in this case, for these pictures, I made a variant that's blue, and then I went into the prefab for the enemy, the original enemy, and I made it bigger, and it changed the size of the blue one as well, right? <coughs> so I'm going to walk around just to make sure everybody's okay, and then uh, 
yeah, hopefully you guys can play around with this while I do that. All right, let's let's do this variant real quick, which is um, kind of optional. You don't have to do it, but if you want to see how prefab variants work, I'm gonna create a variant. I'm gonna call it enemy underscore blue. I'm gonna double click into it and change the sprite color to be blue. Boom. Now we can see it's blue. <laughs> um, I'll get rid of the second enemy here um, because I'll drag this blue enemy here. And just to showcase, if I go into my enemy prefab and make the enemy slightly smaller, for example, then both of my enemies become slightly smaller, right? Because my blue enemy variant only changed the color, it inherits all other properties. And so when I changed my original enemy prefab to be smaller, the blue enemy prefab also became smaller. How do you make a variant again? You click on a prefab that you want to have a variant of, you right click on it, create prefab variant. Create, hang on, prefab variant, there we go. Yep. And then you would edit it like any other prefab where you can double click on it to open up it in the, as a prefab view, and you just modify it like you would any other object. So just a little bit about prefabs. We won't be using them directly a lot in this, but very useful if you have, you know, a lot of games that have repeating objects, right? Um, so that's a quick overview of prefabs. So last time we talked about animations and we set up the different animations to actually play when we're moving our character around. But as you noticed, our player only m looks like they're moving to the right even when we're moving to the left because that's the sprites and how they were drawn. And so we want to flip the player anytime they're moving to the left, right? Um, and so it's just this section just to cover about that. It'll be a new variable and some function and, and a function that we'll be adding to our script. So this is just pure programming, which is why I didn't really cover it last time because last workshop was more about artwork. But again, for our animations, the player is shown only facing one direction. What we do to flip the player horizontally is you can change the x scale by multiplying it by negative <coughs> one. So if you multiply, so again, usually scale is used to make things bigger or smaller, but if you multiply it by a negative number, it flips the, the object, right? And so we know, so the, the idea here for the, pro, for the code is we know that the player is moving, or where the player is moving, because we have this direction variable inside of our update method, and we're just gonna check the value of that direction variable um, as well as a new boolean that we're going to make called moving right. And then based on those conditions, basically, we can flip the player. And that's going to call a function that we're going to make where all it does is get, it fetches the player's uh, transform. It multiplies the scale by negative one and then, um, you know, updates the conditions and stuff. Um, so I'm going to jump into the editor for that because it's, you know, I, you'll just see me program it essentially. But in our player, the player has the player script, so I'm gonna open that up. We have a whole lot of stuff. I'm gonna collapse them real quick so it's not so cluttered. So now it's a bit hidden. But when we move, remember we have this um, direction variable where if direction is zero, that means the player is not moving. If direction is negative, uh, is negative, that means the player is moving left. And if direction is positive, that means the player is moving to the right. So we need an extra boolean to check for condition of which way we're moving, basically, right? Um, because we only want to flip a player when we change directions, so not any time we are, right? Like when we change directions. So 
I'm gonna create a new variable that has a type boolean. I'm gonna name it moving right and I'm gonna default it to true. Okay. Uh, because by default, when we load our um, uh, character into the game, they're facing right by default. Right, because, and I, and I know that because when I made the sprites, the sprites showcase the character moving to the right. So if you have sprites, like artwork, that show them moving to the left, the, by default they'll be facing left, right? So, I have this Boolean moving right, and then we have this direction uh, variable that we can check for. So essentially, the idea is this. I'm gonna pull it up here. Okay. So, if my direction is not zero, then we're running. Otherwise, we're not running. So this is what we did last time with our animations. But we also want to check here specifically if it's positive or negative, right? So if my direction is negative, then we're moving left. Else, we're moving right, right? And I can just put an else statement because um, we know it's not zero. Um, so here, so we have, let's say, let's say this. Moving right is true by default, right? So let's say if we're moving right, as in we have been moving to the right, and now we're moving to the left, that means we've flipped, right? Because this is saying that the input that we're getting is we're moving to the left, but previously we've been moving to the right. So we have this condition here. If we're moving to the left now, and we have been moving right, then we want to flip, right? That's a function that we're gonna be making, but here I'm just gonna call it because I know I'm gonna make it. So what we're gonna do is we're flip our character, right? Otherwise, if we have not been moving to the right, Right, if we have been moving to the left previously and now suddenly we're moving to the right, we want to flip our character again, right? So if um, if our I guess to you know write it out, if our direction is positive, meaning if we're moving to the right, and we're not moving <laughs> we're not moving to the right. So as in our Boolean moving right is where we've been moving previously. And then again, remember this little exclamation point is an operator to be the opposite of, right? Previously moving to okay, and we again we want to flip here as well. So it's just an extra variable that we introduced to check where we have previously gone, because remember what we're gonna when we're gonna code this flip function, it's going to well flip the character. We don't want to do that every single frame. So even though we're moving to the left, we don't want to you know have our player kind of jig jag and do a little dance every single frame. We only want it to change when we tell it to change, when we're moving in the opposite direction now, right? So let's create this flip function. I'm just gonna go all the way to the down all the way down here. Um, and I'm going to create a private function, because I don't want anything outside of the script to access this function. I'm gonna say void, which this is a typical header that you'll have because a lot in a lot of game development functions, void means that it doesn't return anything, it just does something. So it doesn't really calculate anything, it just does something. So our flip function only just does something, so it's gonna be void, and I'll call it flip. Whoops. Flip, right? So what do we want our flip function to do? Does anybody have any ideas? on what our flip function should do. It's kind of similar to our camera movement script in a way. Somewhat. <laughs> yeah, what's up? How, what do you think? Uh, Transform.scale.x equals um, transform.scale.x times negative one. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll write it out so that it's kind of like, we'll be setting ours to that. Uh, because Unity is tricky with that, but that's exactly what we're gonna be doing, right? We're gonna get the scale of our player, multiply by negative one, and then set it to that. Uh, the reason why I say it's a little tricky is because, for example, let's say I wanna do this. 
I want to get my game object. I want to get the transform, the position, the or sorry, not the position, the scale. Um, it'll default it to local scale. Dot x, and let's say I want to multiply it by negative one. This, by the way, is shorthand. Is if you want to take your value and just do some multiplication to the same value. You could do multiply equal or star equal to multiply it by negative one. But the reason why we have to work around this is because this game object dot transform is a read only. So if you want to change, you can set it, but just not individual components like this. So you can't change your specific scale or your local scale or your position uh, components with like the dot x, right? You can't set it directly, so which is why we need to do this roundabout method of creating a new vector3 variable that saves the current position, or sorry, we're going to save the current scale, we're going to update the scale, and then set the scale to this variable. So it's like, because you can't set it directly, we have to do it in this roundabout method. So again, we do that by doing game object dot transform dot local scale which is just its scale. And we want to save that into a variable. I'm going to call it maybe like cur scale for current scale. And this also, if you hover over it, is a vector three, because we have the x scale, y scale, and z scale. With 2D games, you don't use the z scale component ever. So I know that it's a vector three, so I'm going to make my current scale variable a vector three. So now, what we have said before, just now, is multiply the current scale, but the x component only, times negative 1. So this is the same thing as writing this. Sorry. Just, I'm going to leave it as a comment. That's the, that's the same thing. I'm just writing it in a shorthand way because it's nice and easy to do that. So again, we edited this scale variable and we just set our scale of the player back to this variable. So we have game object dot transform local scale is my current scale that I have modified, right? So what I've done is, okay, let's think about it this way. We have been moving to the right, so moving right is set to true. Now we're suddenly moving to the left because of my input. When I flip, I'm going to flip my player by the x value, but I have to update this moving right boolean, right, of where we're moving. So if moving right is set to true, right, because we have been moving to the right, oh my god, whoa, whoa, am I right, okay. So if it's true, I want to set it to false, and if it's false, I want to set it to true. Right? So basically, we want to flip it. And a very easy way to flip something, uh, the value of it, especially with the Boolean variable, is set it to the opposite of it, like so. So we're just setting at the end, we update our conditions. We're saying our moving right is now the opposite of whatever, right? which makes sense. If we've been moving one way and we flip ourselves, now we're moving the other way. right? And now that helps us with you know, doing our condition checking later up here with this variable, okay? So this is uh, what we updated here in our update method. And we created this new method called flip. I'm gonna leave it on screen in case folks want to copy it if there's anything they've missed. And then I wanna just showcase it in action. So now if we play our game, so we have our player moving to the right, which we had before, and our player jumping, which we had before. But now when we move to the left, the player flips themselves, and it works, right? which is pretty awesome. And I think that's lovely, because now this feels like a real game. It's coming together. And then our player sticks to the ground, which we don't want. So. Yeah, I found that out the last time. Yeah, our player is sticking, which we don't want, but it's a really simple fix. Um, my guess, actually I probably should look it up, is that by default you have 
objects that have a rigid body have some friction to them. Pavel, do you know if this is true? I don't know if you looked into this before. If, they, if objects by default have a friction to them, they, that's what this the issue comes from. But essentially, in, as you see this picture here, rigid bodies have a property called material, um, which is useful if you want to play around with stuff that, like, let's say, bounces around or stuff with friction, right? So if you want to play with any like physics simulation heavy games, you probably want to mess around with your materials a lot. Materials are also used very heavily in 3D games when you have something more kind of photorealistic in a way. But by default, if you don't have a material, they have some friction to them, which is why our player sticks to the ground because there's friction between the two and it stops the player from falling. Essentially, we can just override this by creating our own material, I just call the material no friction. And I set the friction to zero, and I drag it into this material property for my player's rigid body, right? Which I will show right now. Super easy fix. So as a good, as good practice, I'm going to create a new folder inside of my assets for materials, even though I will only ever have one, probably. You could also just not have a new folder for it if you don't want to. You could have maybe like a miscellaneous folder, whatever's best for you. And inside of there, I'm gonna create a material down here. Yes, material. I'm gonna call it no friction because this whole thing, okay, wait, that's not true. It's not material. Uh, I think it's texture 2D. Texture 2D? Yeah. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Physics material 2D. Not just material. Oh, there we go. Sorry. I have to update that in the slide. Uh, but you go to create, and then you go to 2D, and then physics material 2D. So that's my fault. Because materials on their own you use for a lot of like 3D texturing type of thing, for like your 3D models. There we go, that's the right icon. And then, okay, so see by default there's a 0.4 friction, I'm going to make that zero. Uh, but there's also a, a variable for bounciness, which is pretty cool if you want to play around again with physics and stuff like that. And in my player, uh, actually in my player prefab, I'm going to open up my rigid body down here, and it says material none. I'm just going to drag my friction onto there. Sorry, my material onto there. So now it says material no friction. And now when I play the game, my player does not stick to the wall. Which is exactly what we want. Well, apparently he can double jump. <laughs> yeah, as long as you touch the thing. Yeah, there's a little divot in the, uh, in the wall, I think. You could also break the game like that, apparently. Listen, I don't know why that happens. <laughs> I, I think I do know, but it's like a whole thing. Um, so then we get some lovely <coughs> bugs, but don't fling yourself at the wall, I guess. <laughs> so that's just an easy fix for characters sticking. Now, jumping into a different topic that is also pretty simple to cover is building and running your game, uh, which is pretty important to do because you want to do it more often than not because I've, all, I've done game jams where I have never built it and I only build it once right before I submit it and then everything breaks and I'm like, oh, okay, that's just not working. So. Building, the process of building, so a, like to build something is a verb, and then a build is also a noun. So like once you build your game, it's called a build that you can run. Essentially, it just converts all the stuff that you see inside of your editor into an application that you can run. So for example, on Windows, it's, it's going to be your .exe. On Mac, it's going to be your .app files. Um, to open this, uh, there's going to be this lovely window here I will show you guys. You go to File, Build Settings. And it's going to have this window that pops up. And so we see up here, it says Scenes in Build. So there's a little check mark that says Sample, or it says Scene slash Sample Scene, because the scene that we've all been working in is uh, titled Sample Scene. 
If you want, you guys can rename it to like level or whatever you see fits. But this scene has a number for it. It has a number zero because they're all indexed and ordered. So um, in this, um, maybe, no. I had a picture before um, where if you have multiple scenes, you can basically, uh, you can just drag them around and like change the order that they appear in basically. And then here you choose your platform and then this is where your installed build support modules come in. So remember when you installed Unity, you had to, I, I had you select build support for your platform. This is where it comes in because if you want to build and test your game, but you don't have build support for your platform that you're running on, you won't be able to build and run your game. So by most of the time you'll click this Windows, Mac, and Linux. For me, for this computer, I only have Mac selected. So it says Windows, Mac, and Linux, but I can only select Mac, right? Because this is a Mac and I only have Mac build support installed. The default, uh, default um, settings are usually fine. So down here I can click just build or build and run. I usually do build and run because I let it build it and then obviously I want to run it to test it out. So I'm going to click that button. It tells me where to save it. Um, and I'm actually probably going to make a new folder. Yeah. Um, I'm going to make a new folder just called builds inside of my project folder. And I'm going to save it just as build. I don't know, very creative. But essentially you click save, it'll take really, maybe like a couple minutes or a while, depending on how complex your project is. Um, so we'll see how long this one takes. Might be a bit, I might just jump into slides. Oh no, okay, so there we go, it's built slash screen comes up and then it jumps straight into the game because I told it to build and run. Again, if you have a complex project, you could just do build and it'll tell you when the build is done and then you run it whenever you want. And so now you can see, oh, okay, lovely. This is the game that I have, right? And then my player died. Okay, uh, I didn't implement a, um, I didn't implement any like exit screen so I'm actually gonna quit my build out I just alt tab or com you can alt tab or command tab and then force quit it out because we didn't implement any way for us to exit the game but basically build settings you again that you can open this window by going file build settings it's super useful and do this more often than not and then I think the next slide is just um, yeah, if you, ju if you just hit build and run, it's just going to build it from the last settings without any, if you didn't change anything, it'll just base it off of that. Um, and then obviously if you only build, you can, wherever you save the build, you can just run it directly from there. And then again, build and test your game often. I learned from my mistakes. <laughs> um, okay, questions on building or anything like that? Anything we've covered so far? Hopefully pretty straightforward. So now... Jumping into another topic, really, you know, we're going, we're doing a lot of stuff today, is timers, which I think are, happen a lot in, in video game programming, just from my experience, you have a lot of like callbacks and then timers for things to happen, right? For our game that we're working on, well, again, what are they used for? Lots of things. For the game that we're working on, we're gonna have two different timers. Essentially, after the player takes damage, I want them to be vulnerable for a certain amount, right? So kind of like, I guess, similar to Mario. Is Mario vulnerable? Uh, and then after we have this uh, pickup, which we can, we'll put into the game today. Um, and then I want them to kind of uh, move faster, probably like double speed for a certain amount of time, right? Um, and the idea is, so, okay. Now that we're, this is kind of session four, I want you guys, before we get into programming the timer, to have this pick up in your game. And I've taught you a lot, so I want you to kind of do it on your own. Basically, I want you to create a prefab that's called pick up power. Um, and all it does is when the player collides with it, it gets destroyed, right? So 
I hope that there's enough in the script already for you guys to be able to do this on your own. But essentially, I have some steps here if you want to take those steps. And then I'll do it at the end with you guys as well. But I want to walk around, and I want you guys to take a look at this first. And you can get these, the sprite for this from this link here. The tiny URL link is uh, to download the zip file for all these sprites. Okay. All right, I'm gonna do this real quick. Um, hoping to get through some more stuff. Okay, so um, the actual pickup object itself is not terrible and the code for destroying it if the player collapses with it is also not terrible. And well, timers are not terrible either, but we got to get to them. So let me see if this, uh, there we go, okay. So actually we might have them in here. Okay, yes we do. We have a pickup power up here. So I'm gonna put that here, just drag it in. I'm gonna call it pickup power up, or I think just pickup power is fine. Um, I'm gonna give it a collider, box collider, because I want my player to collide with this. But I don't want it to collide physically, so I'm gonna make it a trigger like so down here, um, so that there's no physics being hit there. Right, so that's kind of what it looks like right now. So now if I go into my player script, so in terms of the object itself, that's fine, it's there. I'm gonna go into my player script. Okay. And then I'm gonna collapse <coughs> this. But remember we have on trigger enter 2D. So we have this, if we're triggering by colliding with a trigger in this function, this is what we do. So we have else if collision game object. Oh, but look, we need to have a tag for it, right? That we have that we can check for. Because all of these others check the tag of the object. So I go back and my power up, I give it a tag here. So under the name, there's a thing called tag. I cl click add tag. I'm going to call it pickup power. Uh, very original. And then I will apply this tag here. Um, so now if we collided with pickup power, so that means we, we hit a power up, we want to destroy the power up, and what we can do is we call this function destroy, which basically kills the object, but we want to colli uh, destroy not us, the game object, but the game object of the collision. So we can access that by this variable collision, which is defined up here by default with Unity. Unity provides that for us. And then we do collision.game object. So that's going to destroy the power up object. Right? And then when we, when we hit this, we want to also um, essentially power up, set a timer as well, right? So here, um, this is where we're like, okay, we hit this power up, we want to set this timer and get the timer going and, you know, work with that. Um, and so I'm personally going to create some variables and... Um, and uh, a function for that. But this is the part here that we had on the screen here where I made the sprite, or I, I imported the slight sprite last time. Um, I made a collider, I made it a box collider, I made a new tag for it, and then in the player statement, I in the player script I added a new if statement, and then I destroy the power up when we, uh, when we collide with it. So now we want to implement the timer. The timer itself is not too terrible. Um, the basic principle for timers is essentially, um, hold on, uh, okay. The basic principle for timers is that we get the current time that we're at right now, and then we have some length for the timer, 
and then we essentially save the current time plus our length, we add those two together, and then we save that to a variable. And then each frame, we check if our current time is equal to or greater than that variable, because that basically means, oh, we're equal to or greater than that time, uh, that time, right? Um, and so in Unity, you can access the current time by the time library, so we have uppercase T time, dot lowercase t time, and that's basically your current time. That's kind of, here's the basic layout for how your time is programmed is gonna work. Uh, but essentially, we have three new variables. We have the length of how long we want our timer to be. Uh, we have a Boolean to see if, we're, if the timer is currently active. And then also a, um, a variable to keep track of the actual point in time where this timer is done, right? We have a function to check basically, oh, we either set it up or we check if it's active and if it's done. We have a function for that. Um, and for specifically the power up, what I want to, for it to happen is for the speed to double of the player while the timer is active, right? So, jumping into our script again, Let's do all of those things. Uh, I guess, yes, we'll, we'll do that timer today. Maybe we'll do the second timer today, and then the rest we'll do next time. So we have new variables, more variables, lovely. More scripting. So we have our three that I mentioned. We have um, power um, length, for example, right? or power timer length. I'm gonna set it equal to five seconds, so this is gonna be in seconds. Then I have a Boolean is powered up to false. By default, my player is not powered up, so that's why I have it set to false. And then we have um, power um, end time, which I'm gonna set by default to zero because that means it's like set to zero seconds, which um, is always gonna be in the past after we start our game up, right? So then, here, we have this on trigger enter, on this pickup. We wanna set our timer, right? I, for, for my own sake, for, to keep it nice and organized, I'm going to create a new function. So again, private void. I'm gonna call it power up timer check. Um, and as you notice with all my variable names and my function names, they are pretty long, but they're very descriptive, right? So they're, that's like the better part of my practice is that especially nowadays with autofill, um, it's better to have it be longer and more descriptive than something vague like F or C. So here I'm going to actually call this function so here I'm going to have, if my timer is not set up, um, set it up. If it already exists, um, check if it's over, right? Check if my timer is over. So essentially here, I'm going to have, I have this Boolean that I have set, right? So I'm going to have if powered up. is powered up. So this is checking, well, I could just do this as well. I can either do is powered up equals false, or I could do if exclamation point is powered up. Right, same thing. So if we're not powered up, that means we want to set our timer up, right? So we're going to have, okay, we're going to set this to true now. And then power end time is going to be my current time plus my power up timer length, right? And then with the speed of my character, remember back from, I think it was the first workshop, we have this speed variable here that we use when we move our character. And so here I could just actually directly make that... Um, times two, right? So I just double my speed right there. So 
Um, this is when we set up our, our uh, timer. Otherwise, if it's already set up, I just need to check if it's done. So what I do is if my current time, which is time.time, .time, is bigger than my power end time, right, which is what I set here, right, that's the same variable that I'm accessing. So if my current time is past this end time, I'm going to revert my speed. So this slash is division. So I divide my speed back by 2. And then I'm going to say that is powered up is now false again. Right? So we, are, we uh, are not powered up anymore. Right? Um, and then essentially, we call it here when we collide with our pickup so that we set up the timer. Um, you could also theoretically have this not be a function. You could split it up into having it be on trigger enter and then on update. But this is like a personal preference of mine, so it's up to you as a programmer. Because essentially here we're setting it up, but to check it, we need to check it every frame, right? To see if it's over. So at the bottom of my update function here, all the way at the bottom, I'm just going to call if we're powered up, then power up timer check. So if, we're, if we are currently powered up, just check if the timer is over. And I'm going to call that inside of my update function so that I'm calling it every single frame. And I just want to showcase to you how that looks like, because we are running out of time. So we have our player moving like normal. The power gets destroyed. And then I just easily jump over, and then now I'm back to normal. Right? So our pickup object got destroyed, because I went on trigger enter, it destroys the object. And then our timer, well, the timer works, right? So um, is there any questions on that? Um, uh, the next timer, you could, if you want to, do at home. It'll be very, it's very similar to this. Um, I will also do that next week. So next next week we'll have like a wrap up where I will try to do as much as I can to finish up. And then if the stuff that maybe we don't go over, um, there's one thing that I could just like link a video because mine's really similar to a tutorial. So, um, okay. Yeah, any questions on timers? so far for what we did today. And this, all the programming stuff that I did today um, and all the like asset changes, whatever, all the assets that we did today and that we worked on will be posted. So you guys can also fiddle with the code and see the code for yourselves. So I just wanna um, go here. Um, that they, uh, in terms of prefabs, that's a tutorial that you guys can look at if you want to fiddle around with more prefab stuff. Um, and then if you're feeling, you know, adventurous, you could modify or create your own power-up, for example, to do something different than speed up the player, right? Um, this is the game jam, which I announced last week, and I know this has been going out, but in case you don't know about it, it's where you make a game within 48 hours, so if you haven't registered for it yet, you can scan this QR code to register for it. Um, also, you're not obliged to come, I guess, if you aren't registered, so it's like, this would be kind of like your interest as well. Although I would like if, if you come, you know. Every morning you better be there. Okay. <laughs> oh um, and then, yeah, so this is now, well, that's it for this workshop. We have one more next week because the game jam is next weekend. So we'll have a workshop and then a game jam right after it, which is a lot of game development. This is just a feedback form. If you guys have any feedback for me, I appreciate it. I do read all of it. So if you, you know, you can leave any comments, anything like that by scanning this QR code. And then again, next time is, I'm calling it events and audio because those are some higher level programming things um, that we will cover. But again, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do what I can within the time without, you know, eating into too much of your guys' time. So can thank you, you for coming. Can you show the last bit of code again? I didn't for, the, it. for the timer? Yeah. OK, yeah. So I just wanted to, I'll switch to that real quick. But I just want to say thank you guys for coming so much. Uh, I do appreciate it, and I hope to see you there next week. Also, you
not coding, but we have a game night uh, on Friday at 7.15 with the uh, board game club. We'll have like uh, video game board games, regular board games. If you're interested, please come. It's in, uh, you, you mean one tomorrow? Website. Yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow. I will be so playing you the mean where? UU 102. It's in the Discord. Um, Union 102 at 7.15? Yeah. So if you guys are interested in that. Uh, and that's the timer code. There's also, a there's also one line in our update function. What'd you do?